morning everyone so this session is about uh, hack the tech the innovations the presenters will be uh, presenting their innovations and then the the judges will judge them in this video titled abjil for the rescue we present a unique case of scleral rupture for which gelatin sponge was used to tide over the crisis a 62 year old gentleman presented to us with sudden diminution of vision in right eye of one week duration with diagnosis of total bullous rd in right eye with break at 12 o'clock position was taken up for er surgery standard three port pars plana vitrectomy was started after confirming pvd with tricot four vitrectomy was completed to localize the superior break as the rd was bullous we planned to support the posterior retina with pfcl during pfcl injection we noticed a sudden give away in the globe loss of visibility in the vitreous cavity and rapid movement of the intraocular fluids when the visibility returned we noticed a full thickness retinal tear in the superiotemporal quadrant which was 1 to 1/3 clock hours in size attempt was made to further stabilize the globe first fcl then with air injection we opened up the conjunctiva and tenons capsule sutured the cornea with saveno vicryl suture and further dissected the conjunctiva and tenons posteriorly our agony we noticed further collapse of the eyeball with hypotony we noticed a circumferential tear from 9 o'clock to 12 o'clock position attempt to suture it was in vain as we could not localize the posterior lip further rotation of the eyeball to inferomedial quadrant increased the gaping fish mouthing as the inner opening into the suprachoroidal space was small we decided to plug this with gelatin sponge under air fluid exchange after plugging few small pieces we could see that the iop was building there was immediate restoration of vitreous cavity endolaser was done and silicon oil was placed on the first post operative day and one week later the globe was well formed with maintained iop oil was in situ in vitreous cavity without any outflow and retina was well opposed we can conclusively say that gelatin sponge can plug small to moderate inadvertent tears in the choroid and retina safely thank you for that wonderful video rajesh i'll open it up for the judges rajesh great video really nice out of the box thinking i know the situations come we end up sometimes panicking wait a way to the glue any idea to how long can it side die what did get absorbed what happens to it? Uh, we have around eight cases it was different in two different situations we had this but we have you know we electively used this is for approximately about three weeks over which as each scar forms so i cannot exactly say but it's visible for at least three weeks one more option possibly can be an amniotic whether the amniotic membrane is so thin enough whether it will sustain the pressure which you have infused inside maintain the globe is the correct in no toxicity uh, reported no. no gelatin to retina i don't know any studies that has been done but we haven't got any reaction or anything in... did you put the uh, sutures to the recti muscle and then you could not because i couldn't make out uh, that in the video and we couldn't engage because it was torn it was from lateral okay. rectus to superior rectus almost 2 uh, clock hours or the scleral tear and that's why we put a uh, you know redundant sutures to the clear cornea and tried to you know pull it mentally because if you go and put uh, hook the muscles it might tear even further because it was a radial tear in the sclera rajesh uh, you had a scleral tear going inside sir then the gelatin sponge the gelatin sponge is natural yes sir what happens to the scleral edges one the gaping you have to suture there what do you do or you go back and put in a graft 
Uh, I think we need to, uh, this two weeks later I had taken up just in the same coin because the oil was not leaking, there was no anything which was going out. I just wanted to see if the scleral tear is what had happened. So went inside, the fibrosis is already set in because of the increased inflammation or whatever. But I did reinforce the sutures into the sclera, but there was no leakage or any What I realized, gelatin sponge is used by surgery people a lot. Exactly, sir. And there's a natural history of absorption of gelatin sponge. But once it happens, what next? No, it question. absorbs, it absorbs, it uh, takes time, two to three weeks, but then the inner scar is already dug. The outer scar, obviously, there will be fibrosis. If it's a very large tear, I think it will give up, sir. Very nice, uh, King. I just uh, was wondering, you said you went in again. But in, ma'am, outside. Oh, uh, you went Around. in, out. Yes, okay. ma'am. Uh, basically, once you've already opened the area, now you know that everything was assured that the globe is firm. Would it have been a better idea to do your reinforcement at the same time? Because two weeks, it's a little messy to try and decide. Because you're always worried you're opening up again. Ma. The second question is, why do you think this happened? I'm the, because uh, my colleague was primarily doing the surgery. I'll address the first and then second and then go the first. So she had clapped the infusion cannula and the IOP was building up. Because she injected the PF seal into it, there was no double bore cannula for the egress of fluid and it was closed system. So that's why when she was injecting, maybe the pressure was so built up, so it gave away. The muscles were tagged even before surgery. No, no ma'am, it was a primary width, there was no buckle no. that was done. Yeah, because sometimes these eyes have radial scleral dehiscences. The break is usually within that. Within that so yes, those are areas, operatively, Let's look at all four quadrants and if oh, you see those black lines, then you have to be a little Better to be careful. The second, I mean, the first question you had asked was, uh, why, why didn't you go at the same time? Because it was, I mean, uh, it was under local anesthesia, patient was already getting too very tensed about it, even I was tense because we didn't know what was happening, it was just not holding up. Then I opened the conductor to see a tear. I thought it was very small, so looking at the inside of the uh, retina, but the tear in the sclera was quite large. So whatever I could do with my, you know, that kind of a mental setup. So I just tried to screw it, I mean, suture it up, but I couldn't. But then I uh, introduced the inner abgel and it was staying quiet. So I just filled it up and left it. So I, since the second surgery was, I don't know whether it was really essentially or not. I just wanted to make sure that the sclera is not giving away because once you remove the oil, it shouldn't gape up. So that's why I went and just opened the, uh, the conjunctiva and the tenons and to see where it was, but it was already fibrosed. So I just left it as well. I didn't do anything much. Thank you, ma'am. Your take home is for the audience that you should have Abjil in the theater available. Uh, probably uh, rupture is too posterior in some cases where we can't suture the posterior as aspect. You can go in and. Uh, like this, sir. This is what I ran in my first I mean, case. Also. Uh, related posterior rupture, or not suture. It's difficult to suture. This, this will be applied. I mean, the first case which I did was the same, it was an impacted foreign body which I pulled it out and it started, the PSL, everything started to run into it, into the retrobulbar space. There is when I first used this, but I didn't use in such a large term and that's why I presented. Just one last, can I ask a question? Just one. How do you insert it? I mean, did you enlarge your sclerotomy? The abgel? You can take it to a 23 itself, you can take a force. So the only thing that you have to make essence is it should be dry. You can't fill it in a fluid filled dye. If you, by the time you go, it absorbs, it swells up and becomes brittle. So it has to be an air fluid dye and then you have to take it directly into the space and leave it. So once it absorbs the fluid or blood, it swells up and then plugs neatly. So, Madhu, uh, can I make a quick Sure, sure. Thank you. So, uh, another take home message in this case, Ajay is wonderful. We, what Ajay, extraordinary for what Ajay was saying. Wherever, whatever you inject inside the eye, there is tricot, FCL, because we have seen studies of scleral rupture. So always I use a vent on the other hand sure. because of the fear of the double work line like getting blocked in this Routine. So you must make it a routine. Anything we are injecting inside the eye, there should be a vent in the other. Point well taken, sir. Rajesh, uh, how many cases have you used not apart from this experience? Uh, we have used for about eight cases till date with uh, pit. We've used in uh, recurrent uh, breaks in which it was not closing. Okay. And As ma'am suggested, it'd be a good idea like before uh, putting it inside, take a loose sutures outside and use it as a mesh and then put it over it. Can be sir, but I haven't tried it. I know. Next time when you do. Sure. Wonderful innovation. Thank you, Rajesh. Thank you. Can you have the next uh, presenter please, Dr. Sangeet?
Sangeet in the other session, I guess. Okay. Uh, Dr. Tirmalesh? In our video, we will be discussing the steps of assembling a needle for suprachoroidal delivery of drug and technique to deliver the same. Materials required 26 gauge needle, 22 gauge Vinflon IV cannula, 15 number blade with Bart Parker handle. As shown here, length of 26 gauge needle is 11.5 millimeter. Keeping this in mind, 22 gauge Venflon IV cannula is measured for 9 mm length and is cut. Care should be taken for the ends to not rebound off the sterile area. Then we assemble 9 mm long cut part of cannula over 26 gauge needle in such manner which leaves 200 micron of the needle end exposed. With this technique, two suprachoroidal injection can be made from one cannula. In this patient, we planned intravitreal injection of anti-VEGF with suprachoroidal triamcinolol acetate injection in same sitting. 3.5 mm from the limbus at pars planar zone, intravitreal anti-VEGF delivered. AC tap was taken to decrease the eye pressure and allowing the injection in suprachoroidal space as much as 200 microliter as shown here. Entry should be made at 45 degrees for 200 micron of exposed needle part. After gently removing the needle, there was no regurgitation of the drug. Suprachoroidal space in its usual state, wherein this picture, which was taken post suprachoroidal injection, delivery of the drug can be confirmed in suprachoroidal space. Immediate post injection montage funders photo showing clarity of the media and thus reconfirming complete delivery of the drug in suprachoroidal space. Thank you, Thirumlesh, for that presentation. Very wonderful innovation. Uh, how many injections have you given like this? Uh, given about 10. 10, okay. Basically, uh, the video is not to place injection. Uh, basically, to demonstrate in principle that this patient may access. If we were developing this particular technique, there was inavailability of the super that so in all those 10 uh, cases, the injection was deposited in suprachoroidal space only, it didn't have. We had given intravitreal injection, along with that we had given. In all the cases. Because I'll open uh, it up to the judges now. I did not want, uh, you know, the patient not to get the benefit of the I, This was an add-on. Malesh, uh, just some suggestions, you know. Uh, you are using the cannula, and now we use the cannula because the the length of the bevel of a 26 is 1300 micron. Uh, we measured it with the length the of the bevel of a 26 gauge is 1300 micron. It. The inner diameter of a cannula is much larger than the outer diameter of the head. When you go in, I saw you going in the last video. When you go oblique, but actually not utilizing uh, uh, availability. So you have, a, you have a needle which is going inside. If you have a space in between, regurgitate. They no, have no, no sp I didn't see another. There, I think you're utilizing the sclera rather than the sheath for prevention of regurgitation. 
no uh, the regurgitation part sir uh, you had used the cannula only to uh, the you know as a as entry. a as a breaker right, because yes, i saw your bevel was more than 200 microns saw it on the picture and if it is more than 200 microns you have to go obliquely you cannot go perpendicular exactly sir that's what if i was you trying go to demonstrate obliquely, if you go obliquely what is important is you know the angulation at which and i think it's a so that was the point that uh, the angulation at 45 degrees is what creates the valve which prevents the because if you look at uh, the other needles, they say that you have to enter perpendicular. That's why the length is kept at uh, either 1100 micron or 900 micron on for the cell. What I was showing was if you keep the needle a little longer, enter obliquely, you have two advantages. One is you create the valve and uh, that will prevent the rigor. And you are definitely sure that you are in the space. The better part of not creating the valve is uh, is the is the hypotenuse of a triangle oh, which yeah. you're traveling more important by which you calculate you have now nomograms available at what angle what distance travel that you can have the exact thing thank you sir. i just had one quick ct the supracoroidal spaces fairly you form what did you do with the triumphs in order? Crystals would have caused some different appearance. Okay, you diluted. Because I was having food. Um, uh, I did not have the very So we had diluted it. I would have thought it's more like a clear fluid that has gone in than uh, crystals. Out when see, I looked at the picture, you can see in the as well. Doesn't have yeah. diluted. I must congratulate you for getting those pictures because we have tried getting pictures immediately after injection. By the time we get the patient from the OT to the uh, I have tried on UBM because it disperses so rapidly that it. We had few, very few injections on the day, so I. One last question. Great technique and a great idea. We actually simplified this. Take for the sclerosis. So like the clear side in exactly. any consideration. Patients that we had chosen were ones which were within Mike, please thermal Where within normal refractive range because we are not using this on a routine basis. It was done for a very specific purpose because uh, they had uh, asked, uh, you know, is there a way to deliver? At that point of time, I did not know that uh, Ajay sir had uh, and uh, clear sight, which was supposed to give us the needle, had recently entered into a collaboration with us. But we had a need that, you know, thing had to be done that what we were developing that was go forward. They asked me that, so that's why this work went on for six I you tried it in the category guys. I saw that it was the length we based on that. Then uh, we chose patients who were of normal reach this uh, and why I gave it after giving an intravital injury. You can see that when we give the intravital that particular patient. Similarly, when I give a procuratal <coughs> and if I had inadvertently breached the screen, invisible. So that was that was the reason of demonstration. Gave the interval and him sitting on that. That there is a breach that would have been. would you suggest doing paracentesis before giving uh, uh, the supracoordination all patients? Definitely. Definitely. Because if you do not do a paracentesis, the pressure inside the globe will be so high, it will cause the drug to regurgitation despite the valve. I found in supracoral space can take effect about point zero eight was a what our observation is I've done about ninety eight eyes now. I had injected two hundred microliters. So really? I had injected two hundred microliters. The volume was larger. Oh, that is what that was also the reason why I had done the parasite. 
and clear set biomedical will not give you any information the whole company is based on one micro need what's the indication in this patient this particular patient had diabetic macular edema uh, the thickness was somewhere around 400 micron so i've considered uh, giving both antivegf uh, and steroid at the same sitting in this uh, we gave the steroid what is the advantage of giving a supracoroidal injection over the standard intravitreal injection uh, actually uh, there have been a few studies where they have given supracoroidal trimethylone although it was not as effective as intravitreal injection but if it is definitely an add on you have given an intravitreal injection that will take care of it whatever we have given would definitely reach the macula to a certain extent it would go what do you think will be the real indication for a supracoroidal injection with the upcoming cell therapy gene therapy uh, you know uh, to deliver a subretinal uh, vector you know going inside the eye doing a complete vitrectomy inducing a pvd inducing a detachment and then delivering the virus subretinally so in this particular technique you can put it from outside with, with all these invasiveness gone away and especially with uh, you know a gene therapy where they uh, yeah, probably for lca and all that you might be doing it in children where you induce the pvd and cause a detachment those kind of cases it help when when a vector which is going to follow up problems is available my video or the purpose of my presenting this was to show that the space can be accessed very safely and the drug can be delivered that was the basic idea of present thank you sir bilesh for this presentation for the want of time we'll move on to the next presenter can i have dr mohit togra please why play ki or oh, can you uh, play it voice nahi aa raha aapka jo play kar rahe hain pt trouble shoot this there's no background music or the voice स्टेरॉइड्स which are better appreciated on auto fluorescence imaging as confused with uveitis ophthalmologists initiate corticosteroids which are lympholytic and further delay diagnosis even steroid leads to disappearance of b cells prior to vitreous biopsy biopsy is the gold standard for diagnosis but vitreous biopsy often comes out to be negative while retinal biopsy is cumbersome and has its own complication rate PVRL cells are located mostly anterior to Brooks membrane as shown in this OCT image invading vitreous retina subretinal space and space between RPE and Brooks membrane thus access to subretinal space logically appears to improve the cytological diagnosis a 66 year old male was taken for diagnostic projection after making sclerotomy ports vitreous biopsy was taken under air at 600 cut rate per minute followed by diluted vitreous sample which was taken by infusion on following which core vitrectomy was completed after posterior vitreous detachment site of minimal invasive subretinal biopsy was chosen away from the macula retinotomy was made at the edge of the lesion and 25 gauge soft tip was inserted in subretinal space and moved in all directions to increase the yield fluid air exchange is done and endolaser is applied to the retinotomy site ports are sutured the 6 year old female is undertaken for diagnostic vitrectomy the vitreous biopsy is taken as per steps previously highlighted a retinotomy is made at temporal edge of large subretinal lesion using 25 gauge soft tip minimal invasive subretinal biopsy is taken the tumor cells are displaced using this 25 gauge soft tip towards the retinotomy site these repeated movements help in debulking of the tumor cells and their aspiration into the soft tip 
fluidal exchange followed by laser around the retinotomy is done. Case 3 highlights the use of intraoperative OCT in minimally invasive subretinal biopsy. IOCT shows CME and location of lymphoma cells between RPE and books. As this lesion is a posterior pole, we choose another lesion for MISB located superiorly. IOCT shows the lymphoma cells going into the lumen of soft tip cannula. In pre and post biopsy OCT picture, we can see flattening as well as decrease in the width of the lesion. Endo laser is done. Biopsy from vitreous smear shows scanty lymphocytes while subretinal aspirate shows plenty of lymphocytic cells. We had 7 cases of subretinal biopsy of which 2 were diagnosed on vitreous while all 7 cases showed lymphocytes in minimally invasive subretinal biopsy. All 7 cases were CG20 positive while 2 cases had CNS involvement. Subretinal biopsy helped in early diagnosis and reduced delay in the initiation of treatment. Thank you, Dr. Mohit, for the presentation. So, how, how long follow-up you have for these cases? So, uh, yeah, we actually now have 11 patients of these. So, this was actually, I, I, I made this presentation some time back and, you know, same thing. So, I, we have 11 patients now. And uh, so, the median survival, which is actually reported for, uh, you know, intra for primary vitreoretinal lymphoma patients without CNS involvement is now actually, uh, you know, gone up quite a bit. The, the, the improved chemotherapeutic regime. So, uh, Previously, we used to lose these patients within the next couple, you know, couple of years, maybe three years, even after making a diagnosis. But now, I think uh, out of all of these 11 patients, barring one who had concomitant CNS involvement uh, uh, at the time, so we lost uh, that lady. But other than that, we, 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 you know, we have 10 patients who, who are actually on therapy and uh, have had, uh, you know, the other eye involvement needed, uh, you know, injections uh, in that eye. Uh, uh, so uh, follow up. So so the so so long story short, the median follow up. I you know I haven't calculated, but I don't think I have follow up of less than one year on any of these. Okay, it's so no two, surgery three, related complications in these patients. No none. I had a retinal detachment in my last one, and uh, that was because I you know the the hyaluronic has to come off anytime we want to get into the subretinal space. So I had a PD induced horseshoe tear in the periphery, which I missed, and that's what caused the retinal detachment later on. I had to fix. I'll open it for the judges now. What is this uh, new thing uh, that is, uh, you feel that uh, the subretinal yield is more, that I understood. What is the new thing that so, you said? So it's not radically new, sir. The, the difference is that the standard of, uh, the, 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 the standard of care for diagnosing vitreoretinal lymphoma is a diagnostic vitrectomy. It is not a subretinal biopsy. The, uh, so, so, and so, the, so uh, if, you, if you were to look at the data from the West, which is from, you know, where we get most data of these, so median of 2.1 vitrectomies are required uh, over, you know, to, to uh, actually get a positive sample. The, what, I'm, what, what I've been, uh, you know, advocating with this for a uh, you know, couple of years now is that if, you know, you have those yellow, dull yellow looking cells visible in the subretinal space anywhere, not only will the, uh, you know, the regular di diagnostic vitrectomy, yes, but minimally invasive, just similar to how we do a re retinotomy for the regardi right over that, and those passive aspiration of cells ensures that the uh, false negative rate after a vitrectomy d doesn't happen because we, we don't use a cutter. Even if we reduce the cut rate of a cutter, it's still cutting away the vitreous and the morphology because of the turbulence gets of those cells goes off. And the, and the cy uh, cytologist can't actually help us much. However, if you are passively aspirating A from the source and B because there is no cutting action and goes directly into the syringe, the syringe gets capped and sent over. And uh, that was also shown in uh, the last, uh, the, the second last slide in which the yield is more, the cells look exact. I mean, I remember the first time I sent this to my colleague over to, uh, when, I, when I did this about three and a half, four years back, my colleague actually called me, said, we have seen such cells in blood, mein bhi nahi dekhe. Uh, you know, people who have lymphoma cells and you know all over so uh, the morphology that i got with that and there is the at least i haven't had a false negative uh, ever since i've been doing it. i have a, a few questions for you sure. one is uh, why did you choose 25 gauge and not a 27 or a 41 gauge uh, one sure. second is how do you aspirate do you aspirate manually or because while aspirate because we are we are in a innovation session so we have to on those lines, sir, sir. Uh, you have to aspirate manually, or do you have a machine assisted aspirate? Absolutely. And third, how do you choose where to enter? Is it OCT based or is it just clinically you find those yellow reports? Oh, 
for sure. So regarding the gauge, sir, so in general, I do 25 gauge surgery across the block, uh, as do most people in in PGI, sir. So I so uh, our 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 setup, our you know all the instrumentation with 25 gauge is what we tend to you know have most of the time. So it's a preference that way. 27 gauge would work absolutely fine, sir. Just for aspiration, but not the vitrectomy. So, so once we have the port ready, sir, uh, I mean, once we have those 25 gauge ports, I don't think it's going to make a difference. Regarding why we don't use a 41 gauge is because that's also linked to the answer of your third question, sir. So uh, this is passive aspiration. It's not machine linked. So just a, a, a soft tip, a, a soft tip cannula goes onto a 2cc syringe and the plunger is off. We, we, we use the passive capillary action and, you know, we go straight into it like one would do a passive fluid air exchange in um, uh, during... Uh, during reg RD, uh, you know, FAX. If one were to really go slow, like, you know, some people tend to do. Um, uh, so, so it's not machine, uh, it's not machine linked, it's not active. And we need a 2cc syringe, we, and we need, uh, so if it's a 41 gauge, those cells will, will not come up, uh, because for the capillary action to occur, we need a little, little bigger bore. Uh, otherwise, the capillary action will go down, because it's proportional to the fourth part of the radius of the... Uh, uh, of if the, you're given a device which can aspirate, Absolutely. As long as, as long as, as long as when it aspirates, it goes straight into some container, sir. Goes into a syringe. Into a syringe and that syringe can be sent. And the syringe aspirates. Will that using... Uh, so, uh, quite frankly, this is the easiest part of the whole surgery, the, the, the passive aspiration, because I just, I just, I just sit there and, you know, the capillary action just ensures that it, it comes up. So, it's not a challenge. Uh, the active aspiration can catch the edges of the retina, I guess. It can, sir. It can. Uh, and, and, and hence the... Uh, it get enlarged. Yes, yes. Mohit, would a 40 gauge needle, when you use it, would that will possibly also obviate the need for you to do a laser or any such? Uh, yes, but I don't think then I'll be able to passively, as I was answering, sir, passively aspirate it because the capillary action will not be, to my mind, that strong. This is this is passive, so it has to have a little bit. It's try. It's it's a, a, as I say, akin to uh, you know, if you were to do, you, you we're doing a regular regardi surgery. We you know remove the hyaloid. We uh, you know, we're doing FAX. We're trying to now settle the retina. Now, if we were to try and think that we use a 41 gauge cannula and we try and do FAX and we try and get all of that out, we'll be there till evening because it's not happening. And and, and mind you, that is with the suction of the machine. Uh, this is not with the suction of the machine. So if we were to just use a 2cc syringe, 41 gauge cannula, poke it under the retina and try and expect that all of that because the 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 gauge is so small, the capillary action is very very less. That's why we need a big, bigger gauge because that's what's going to cause those cells to move up the, uh, you know, anti-gravity up into the syringe. Can I have the next presenter, please, before uh, we continue question. the discussion? Dr. Madhu, can I ask just a sure, question? Sure, ma'am. We have two more minutes. Uh, Dr. Dogra, uh, did you mention that you have taken a diluted vitreous uh, yes, biopsy? Yes, yes. Any uh, particular reason? Uh, so, uh, so the standard, so, so, so that passed, I, uh, you know, that part I glossed over, but uh, the, the standard technique for a diagnostic vitreous, uh, you know, surgery, especially if you're doing for lymphoma is that initially the, after the, the three ports are uh, put in, the infusion is begun, not with BSS, but with air. And the initial, uh, and you know, the first one to 1 1.5 ml of vitreous, which is actually taken with the cut rate down to 800 cuts per minute is with air being infused in the eye because we do not want to dilute what we get. But after a certain point in time, that's because because the view, uh, if, if the patient is fake, the view goes, uh, you know, uh, really, really bad after you have about, a, uh, about one ml of air. And after that is done, then we switch the, uh, you know, uh, the BSS on and then we take an undiluted vitreous sample, which is obviously larger, which we can take two, two and a half, three ml. I have a question for you, Mohit. Uh, so, the driving force for your passive is infusion of the system. Uh, is the infusion of the system and just the... Oh, just one second. It's the infusion of the system, which means you have to have that much of a fluid column coming into the needle, come into the syringe. Absolutely. Your retina was virtually dry. Yes. This fluid could also be coming from the vitreous, actually. Uh, so, so that's why. So the, the 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 third of the videos that I showed, the idea of why I why I showed the intra micro VFC, a simple indigenous new. Uh, so, so that that's why the third intraoperative OCT. So it's not required. The intraoperative OCT was just to demonstrate that we can actually see those hyperreflective cells move up the, uh, uh, which you which which by the naked eye you can't see, but you see that the fluid is there. And what you is your end point? Uh, so I you say you got a fluid. 
uh, you can you can in see it sir in the in the, the syringe filling up you can you can you can see the uh, fluid in and the all that is coming from the subcutaneous space yes sir because uh, you go straight you go you go straight you go straight into it thank you dr mohit we'll move on to the next presentation uh, dr subendu kumar boral he'll be presenting his innovation second slide have the next presenter okay dr sangeet can you can we have dr sangeet's presentation so can i have the audio please The arrow is a disposable cannulated MVR like instrument. It is shaped like a spear in the front with a pointed tip and sharp lateral edges. This is used to dissect membranes in PDR or retinal detachment. The shaft is long and curved to conform to the shape of the globe. It has got a small opening just behind its sharp tip. The disposable needle can be connected to the extrusion pump with a reusable handle. This is helpful to remove excessive blood during dissection and to perform hydro or visco dissection. Because the dissection is done using simple to and fro motion, the membrane removal can easily be done by the non-dominant hand also. The long and curved shaft protects the lens and the retina from injury during dissection. Most of the dissection was done using vitreous cutter itself. End gripping forceps was also used to peel some membranes. At one point, we hit a roadblock and no further progress could be made either with the end gripping forceps or the vitreous cutter. This was the time we converted to by manual approach and used arrow for further dissection. The membrane removal, which looked difficult, became just a child's play. Uh, thank you for that wonderful presentation. Good Open it up, the judge. Dr. Sangeet, nice videos. What was the gauge of your surgery? It was twenty-five kg. Is it available uh, commercially, or you have uh, designed it? It is available now commercially. I have designed it, but it is available. It's available. Okay. It's just a question that the full device. Uh, supposing uh, now it's got side cutting edges and a tip which is sharp. Uh, yeah. Supposing I say I use a, a, a 26 gauge long thoracic needle, which is 32 meters long, uh, I can virtually get the same arrow made. Is it different or will this? The, the one difference is, sir, it's uh, slightly curved and slightly long. I don't know about the thoracic needle. Yeah, it's, a no, it's a normal okay. needle. It's a 32 millimeter long. I can curve it the way I want to curve it. 
sometimes when you get a curve, uh, when you curve your needles, like 26 gauge long needles, uh, you, the needle won't enter the cannula, the troca cannula, because of the curve, it just gets stuck into the cannula. So this is particularly designed to enter those 25 gauge cannulas, uh, the curve is made and that curve conforms to the globe also, so you can move in all directions and it also protects the lens at that time. That is one. Uh, I think the only difference which I can think of is the. And then it the can be connected to your, your yeah. device, maybe a little bit more firmer, more stiff. Firmer, more stiff yeah. Yeah. Just one point. Thank you, sir, for the grip. I have actually done that. What you said. I have taken a longer 26 gauge needle, curved it. Yeah. I started using the needle only, yeah. and from the needle then only I modified it. But you are right in the sense that probably the arrow, the device which you firm. Yeah. Maybe easy. Like the membranes as compared to what yes, side cutting. Side entering, cutting can be done with the needle also. In terms of entering and in terms of the plane, in the needle the needle also works well. Yeah, probably great surgical videos. Thank you. And another advantage is because it's connected with the handle that can be connected to the extrusion pump. So the needle you have to connect directly to the uh, to the infusion thing, and then holding it will be very difficult. Nice, uh, Sangeet. Where can one get this? Ma'am, this is available with the Absalons. Uh, not with the tip, but the tears can happen anyhow using whichever the instrument. Bleed also, no? The bleed, uh, the bleed can be taken care of if you attach it to the extrusion pump. The same moment you don't have to come and uh, uh, come out and uh, introduce another instrument. This be more uh, stiff, uh, stiffer than the need is to prevent unintended move. Uh, pardon, sir. Thing would be more stiffer than a regular disposable needle. Yeah, it is. Uh, it is more stiff, sir. So that we can prevent unwarranted or unexpected movements and unintraction. Um, may, may, maybe, sir. The advantage of a needle will be it's disposable. This, the tip is disposable, the handle is reusable, this also. It's a bit costlier there. I don't know exactly. <laughs> what advantage do we have over the scissors in this? Is there any uh, particular advantage you say? Yeah, because the, the use is easier. You just have to make a to and fro motion around the vascular epicenters and it cuts through it. And you can use it with your easily with your non-dominant hand also. In, in a thinner vascular nails, it is easy to, but if vascular nails are a little thicker. Even the thicker ones you can. And effect can create tears. No, oh, that is why it has been kept disposable. That is why. Sir, you go on the either side of the vascular nail and cut it. And you can always combine it with a scissor or a cutter or whatever you do. You can all. Dr. Sangeet, you said this is commercially available, but in the videos you have used your own uh, Innovation? Is that what uh, no, you it, it has been made uh, and then it was given to me and then... Uh, Your innovation was in using that? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Are there any more questions? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sangeet. Thank you. Can we have the next presentation? Good evening, that's what it is. My dear colleagues. Sound, please. New tool access subretinal space in a controlled way. VFC, that is viscous fluid control, is commonly used in vitroretinal surgery to inject silicon oil within vitreous cavity or to extract it in a faster way. We developed a simple indigenous modified VFC to gain access to subretinal space in a controlled way. We have removed the plunger, cut the rubber cap of the plunger of a 1 ml syringe. This cut rubber cap was fitted inside an empty 1 ml tuberculin syringe. Its end was fitted with the tubings of VFC of vitrectomy machine. Now VFC mode was activated. Attaching an either 38 gauge or 41 gauge subretinal needle to the syringe to extract the retained submacular PFCL bubbles or to deliver precise dose of subretinal drugs like RTPA for subretinal hematoma in a controlled way. Here the cut rubber tip of the plunger can move smoothly within the 1ml syringe 
during injection or extraction mode of the VFC attached with the vitrectomy machine. We named it Micro VFC. Firstly, the practical application for extracting the subretinal retained PFCL bubbles. Here it's a case of post surgery for giant retinal tear. There was a large bubble of submacular PFCL threatening phobia with best corrected visual acuity 2060. After removing silicon oil, I used this micro VFC with 41 gauge metallic tip cannula to remove the submacular PFCL bubble. Using viscous fluid extraction mode with 400 psi extraction pressure, PFCL bubble was extracted completely. Post operatively best corrected visual acuity improved to 2040 with complete absence of submacular PFCL bubble. I also use this micro VFC for delivering drugs in subretinal space. Like in this case of post PCV massive submacular hemorrhage with best corrected visual acuity, hand movement close to face, PR accurate, I did vitrectomy with complete removal of posterior hyaluride face. Here I used our VFC with 38 gauge non-metallic cannula for injecting recombinant tissue plasminogen activator 0.05 cc that is 50 microgram directly into the subretinal space through a mostly elevated area just outside the macula for clot lysis. The subretinal injection of RTPA was completed in a very controlled way. Again I have used combination of anti-VEGF ranivizumab injection 0.05 ml and filtered air 0.03 cc and injected slowly in subretinal space outside the macula. Then I completed fluid air exchange and used sulfur hexafluoride gas tamponade. After 3 weeks, best corrected visual acuity improved to 2120, significant reduction of submacular hemorrhage with CNVM remnant only. So this indigenous micro VFC can be used for both extracting subretinal PFCL bubble or delivering the drug subretinally in an exact dose as well as in a very controlled way. It can also be used for further transduction of subretinal gene therapy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Subendu. I'll open it up for the judges now. Very nice presentation, Subendu. Uh, and I just had one small, let us say, a nitpicking doubt about your first case. When you said the uh, the PFCL was threatening the macula. Uh, when there is an alloculated PFCL bubble, which is not under the fovea, not under the macula itself, and a nicely attached retina, do you really expect it to move? Yes, like uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes it may uh, it is threatening the macula fovea. I have the other cases also where it is just beneath the fovea. I have di directly aspirated the foveal, uh, subfoveal PFCL bubble. It was in my other video also mentioned. And directly you can aspirate it. If it is superior to the fovea, it can always involve the fovea. It can migrate up to the fovea anytime. Um, very nice video. Uh, what was the gauge of the needle? It is either 38 gauge or 41 gauge. Uh, when you want to aspirate the drug, say ranimizumab, from uh, that, you still use aspirate. this? Not inject. You, when no, you are aspirating from PFCL, the container, hmm. you use a different needle and then you change to this needle. Like I am when I am planning for the subretinal PFCL removal. That no, I am talking about injection, subretinal injection. injection. Any any needle, eight gauge or 40, uh, 41 gauge. No, pardon, I I didn't you. What ma'am is asking is, yes. when you load your ranibizumab or dibiosizumab to the injection, okay. use a separate needle, then remove it and attach this needle, or you're using the same needle to... Same needle, same needle, same needle. When I'm you injecting the subretinal TPA followed by subretinal uh, this uh, anti vegf I'm using the same needle. No, no, how do you load the injection to the syringe? How do you load, load it? it in the separate needle? Is it for, uh, yeah, that's what ma'am was asking. Then I'm using this uh, 38 gauge or 41 gauge. Just one query, great video sir, is, so you initially cut the edges of the needle and then you fit, or no. you preparing the injector? The uh, like I am, I am just cutting the VFC, the tubing and just attaching it inside the, that uh, 1ml tuberculin syringe behind it. 
and before that inside the needle only the rubber cap is there it is freely moving so you can exactly the purpose of this uh, doing this kind of innovation is you can deliver exact amount to avoid the foveal blowout rupture when you are injecting the subretinal tp or subretinal any uh, injection so in these cases so this kind of complication can uh, be avoided or while extracting the subretinal pf cell can uh, there is uh, always chance of sudden collapse of the space subretinal space so you can avoid the collateral injury with the needle you are using metal needle so the reason i ask is because i use so micromed has got a injector which okay. can be used for subretinal tpa drug delivery and that can be fitted to the vfc system just like we fit our silicon oil injectors and i actually use it for delivering fibrin glue in my cases because that also gives a very controlled way but this is a very useful cost effective substitute uh, this is not this is anybody can make it in their like by its own there is not uh, no, uh, not commercially available means you can make it by its own no no uh, very nice uh, subendu because i'm using a similar device but different way you don't even have to cut the tubing what you are but cutting you the to, vfc tubing but you I have, have to made buy an it, adapter sir. where it is connected and you have a syringe you don't have to cut the tubing because cutting the tubing is i'm wasting 1500 or 2000 rupees spoiling a set so if you are i'm just saying but it's over i'm uh, forget about that the main thing is uh, this is a good technique because your handshake doesn't it is hard. yes you can it's avoid foot that. controlled it delivers the before we take it to further discussion can i have the next speaker dr santosh kumar mahapatra yes doctor just wanted to know uh, how do you lock the system because normally when we inject silicon oil we lock it uh, into the that because now you have cut it so do you need to lock this no no you yeah. can uh, yeah, because it may just uh, the whole thing may just burst out once oh. you press the foot pedal no it slowly slowly you have to increase the pressure or slowly slowly you have to uh, go for the extracting mode not sudden this thing because you are another advantage is you, are, you can reduce the aspiration and the injecting force so drastically with this normal conventional vfc you can use this needle with the conventional vfc but with this micro vfc you can reduce the almost one tenth oh, but <coughs> It, it varies. It is 200 to 400. 200 is good enough. Injection, 200 to 400. I think Sangeet, what he is doing is that you going into the tubercle is self-locking. Self because the diameter is such that it is fitting into the inner diameter of the of the tubercle that it doesn't uh, this thing. Leak. And you are, the pressures which you are using are not very high. You use a pressure between 5 to 10. Maybe that much. You can test it outside by drop by drop. So, when the, what is your advice to the others who want to use it? How easy is it to reproduce the making of this particular? Where exactly should be cut? Is there a chance that the cut part of the stopper gets tilted while injecting? How do we avoid this? That you have to keep your hand very steady to avoid any undue movement of this. Otherwise, your if your uh, assistant is injecting the solution, it might create the micro break. So micro tear you can avoid. You can just fix it with the screra with the hand of the with head of the patient and just inject foot pedal control nothing else very easy I'm asking about preparing this preparing the where exactly to cut that uh, particular stopper you prepare initial preparation of the uh, the uh, one that, that, syringe that's a micro issue that is at yeah. just at the base just before the this your vfc connector I'll, I'll answer that question because we do it routinely just cut it where you have the rubber stopper. We do it for the VFC. Just before the rubber stopper. Doing yes. a lot of small, small innovation in the center. We cut it at where the plastic meets the rubber. Cut the yes. plastic, not the rubber. So yes. you will always yes, yes. consistently always cut the, it at the that plastic. Point. And it has got, you cut the plastic, you'll find a cross there. Hmm. And that cross is where is the actual end point for it. For the want of the time, we'll go to the next presentation. I can you hear the presentation, please? Hello friends, I am here to describe an innovative, no-cost, supracardial triangular delivery system for its use in common indications like DME, post-operative CME or macular edema following retinal fair occlusions. 
As all of us know, intravitreal triamcinol acetate is not affordable to most of the patients for the above mentioned indications and intravitreal or posterior subtenal tricot is associated with increased incidence of trachoma. Supracordial delivery system which involves no cost and negated these demerits came to my mind. We tried to develop a system with usually available simple materials like 22 gauge and 26 gauge needle inside our operation theater. Presuming the scleral thickness at the site of injection at inferotemporal quadrant between 900 to 1000 micron, an injection set is sufficient for delivery of supracardial triamcinolone 900 micron deep. For this, we took 22 gauge needle and broken it from its hub using a needle holder without much pressure. The tip is broken as well. A Castrovigus caliber is taken to measure the exact length of a 26 gauge needle from the needle hub till the beginning of the beefing. The same caliper is used to get the exact length from previously prepared 22 gauge needle shaft, which is put over the 26 gauge needle. Triamcelone is drawn into the 1 cc syringe and the set of the needle thus prepared is fixed to the syringe for the injection. After making it air free and keeping exactly 0.1 ml of residual oil, triamcelone. After proper cleaning and draping, the exact measurement for intravitreal injection is taken as per the lens status and the needle set is introduced into the supracardial space keeping the bevel up. The 22 gauge shaft behaves as a guard for further penetration of the needle, delivering the drop at supracordial space. Following introduction of the bevel, the triamcelone is simply injected and the injection site sealed with a cotton tip applied. One can confirm delivery of triamcelone into supracordial space with indirect ophthalmoscopy or direct visualization under microscope and window illumination or post injection OCT. Hence, I urge my fellow colleagues to try this simple but useful method of supracardial drug delivery system. Thanks for that wonderful presentation. Um, so, can I have a show of hands how many of the audiences who are present here are given a uh, supracardial injection? So I'll open it up for the judges now. Nice video. Did you uh, do any paracentesis or uh, reduce the pre uh, intraocular pressure for the injection? No, no. We have done it uh, like uh, this is basically was given as a thesis one of my postgraduate students. Factor between 20 uh, March to March of 20. We have completed 25 cases of uh, Methacin implant versus 25 cases of uh, supracardial triamcinol acetate. But uh, we didn't uh, come across any increase in IOP following uh, supracardial. The basic difference I would like to uh, highlight uh, because there was same similar presentation in this session also. There are five, I found there are five differences the previous uh, presentation and mine. First is they have used in combination with uh, Antivisefs. Second, they have done a paracentesis. Third, uh, they have used a malleable uh, plunger, uh, which is metallic one in my case. Fourth, uh, they have given in, in super or temporal quadrant. I have given an infra temporal quadrant. Fifth one is uh, they have given bevel, bevel down, and in our case, it is well off. So, I have not, uh, your question answer is we have not done a paracentesis. My only concern was close to the soft and will uh, support. Because is there a risk of sticking? 
That's right. I saw this happening. That was my only concern. So we have that's that the, the to negate this uh, our technique is uh, like bevel up. That sclera acts uh, like uh, as a uh, uh, opposite force. I'm talking about when you prepare it, prepare it. while preparing, you while you're cutting it. Okay, preparing the needle in that process, the needle sticking. That was a little bit the concern for me. That you know, if uh, a younger there is a chance, but uh, we have not concerned. come across because we have after the thesis also we have done around twenty cases. Till now we and my I think my assistants are well versed with. But no. uh, if I remember correctly, you had mentioned that during preparation you would cut off the bevel, isn't it? Bevel was cut? Yes. So there is no real uh, way in which you can put bevel up or bevel down, isn't it? No, no, no. no. That is a cover. A cover. That is a that is the cover, madam. That is a sleeve. What you are saying? It's a guide. The one theory question, why secondary glaucoma is less in uh, supracoroidal compared to posterior subtenon? Or intravitreal. I can explain, but if <laughs> yes, I, I was just thinking it is, it is time. I just wanted. Yeah, be, be, might be because we are delivering the drug away from the like. Uh, they are giving very close no, to no, the no, it's, and no, no, it's not close. The question is that you have to know the anatomy of anterior posterior is optic nerve, internal is choroid, outside is that is the supracoroidal. When you inject anything, it doesn't cross or as a data, so it doesn't go into the anterior chamber. So they have done studies after injecting triamcelone and looked at the amount of triamcelone in the ecosumer. They have found very minimal amount of this. Therefore, it does not cause cataract, does not cause blood. Thank you. Just one small thing. I saw your injection being done in the horizontal plane. Uh, you should try to be always away from the horizontal plane. Injecting be either infratemporal or supratemporal. I have done it in infratemporal. Because if you do it in the horizontal, the patient no, no. has a lot of pain. No, it's infratemporal. Egress? Was uh, there any? If you, if you have properly uh, like entered and given, uh, you should obtain a little dimpling while you are before the injecting so that uh, your sclera is actually acting as a guide. So, most of the time, uh, it does not regress. And uh, the amount should be very carefully gauged. Just, just like I told, it has to be just uh, at exactly uh, 0 0.01 or little more to take care of the dead space in the needle. Should not be more. Will the serial thickness have an impact on this? Uh, thicker slera or a thinner slera? Yes, we have, have um, modifications, yes, something to do. Very good question. Uh, for the thesis, we have uh, had the uh, uh, exclusion criteria like uh, uh, myops more than six diopter or thin sclera. If you are observing a blue sclera, uh, in those cases we uh, don't give this supraglottal. There any guideline on an OCT? If you th measure the thickness, this is the uh, range which is acceptable for a normal supraglottal injection. Or oh, we have not done OCT, but clinically we uh, right. see the patient before getting it for the injection. So and we have uh, outlined the exclusion criteria too. We did that. We did uh, anterior segment OCTs, Indian eyes, all quadrant, full soup, nasal and nasal and temporal. We found out the thickest part of the sclera is usually infotemporal. Based upon that, we decided, and uh, based on the thickness, actually you can decide the angulation. And we have a nomogram in place. At uh, what angle you enter and how much you go to. I think so, the uh, infrared temporal is the most uh, suitable. I think uh, as for your infrared temporal, infra -temporal, infra -temporal, infra -temporal yes, I've done the same. All There are no more questions. We'll go to the next presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ma. Next presentation is by uh, Professor. Avadesh Oli.
So to begin the procedure we make two nicks in the conjunctiva at the marked positions and then we make lamellar scleral tunnels on both sides. Now we use this uh, trocar AC maintainer and we finish off with any vitro retinal procedure which is to be done. Now these uh, needles are 26 gauge, we tie a loop of uh, vicryl around them and this is how we make the needles for both sides. To exteriorize the haptic, we pass this needle through this lamellar scleral tunnel and the haptic is exteriorized and this vicryl loop is slided down as the haptic comes out and then the ends are flanged and the vicryl suture knots are tied. This is how it looks. Here you can see now it is very well secure. It's not going to retract back with whatever manipulation of the other haptic we do. The similar procedure is repeated on the other side. The vicryl loop is slided down as the haptic exits the eye and finally it is tied and trimmed. So here you see the haptic ends are well flanged and then they are buried into these lamellar tunnels. The other side also they are buried into these uh, lamellar scleral tunnels and the advantage is that they are very well covered with the lamellar scleral tunnel and overlying sclera. The intraocular lens is very stable and it is central because the intrascleral length of the haptic is more than in classical techniques and the chances of exposure are also eliminated. Here you can see the intraocular lens is central. Now the blood pool which is collected around the surgical incision, we wait for two to three minutes and then with the help of forceps, we just iron out the conjunctiva and it gets glued to the surface. for the presentation i just have one doubt uh, why was the ac maintainer put why not pass plana infusion like how we routinely put uh, sir uh, what we have seen that in uh, while we are injecting the lens in a glued dial if you use a, a pass plana infusion the iris every time that uh, tries to escape the wound and there is iris chafing so just to avoid that and there was no major vitroretinal procedure planned in this case if we have something major to do, then we prefer a pras plana infusion. Otherwise, ACM with a trocar is sufficient. What is the second major advantage over the routine uh, Yamane technique, the flange technique, which is usually done? Just we don't secure it with the vacuum loop, but just a flange, it retains in the slira. So, compared to that, what uh, specific advantages? Sir, what I feel uh, uh, with the Yamane technique, it's actually we are going trans conjunctival. We do not know what is the scleral length of our tunnel. So, uh, this is a patient who has some lens related complication and till some time back he was actually a refractive surgery candidate and now suppose he has a lens drop or he has some IOL complication, then his expectations are as high as it, it was as if he was planned for a multifocal or a toric IOL. So, in Yamane technique, uh, the amount of scleral length of the haptic is not that much. And there are chances of exposure later on because the haptic which we are putting that is lying just uh, subconjunctival. And uh, Yamane technique, uh, though it has not yet tested the uh, tested the time, but now uh, recently there was a paper in JCRS wherein endophthalmitis post Yamane is a very very significant concern. And uh, second thing is the intrascleral length which we make uh, under direct visualization is uh, giving extra stability to the IOL and the chances of tilt which we have studied in these eyes are uh, very very minimal which are comparable to conventional glue dial techniques or even better. Have you compared this technique with other techniques? 
Uh, I have uh, compared with Yemeni, but the cases are not yet, uh, we have not yet completed that. So in 10 patients, the amount of tilt was more in Yemeni plus the chances of flange exposure. In one of the patients, there was a flange exposure in 6 to 7 months. Low period for the judges now. How does the vicryl help in this? Basically to repage or is it help? Uh, yes, sir. Actually, when Dr. Yamane described his technique, he used a 30 gauge needle with a inner bore which was uh, large enough to accommodate the haptic of the IOL. However, in India, at least I could not find any 30 gauge needle through which I can uh, pass the haptic uh, through that lumen. So maybe there is some, I think in Japan that needle is available wherein the inner diameter uh, it accommodates the haptic. So we are using a 26 gauge uh, needle and the flange which we make. Sometimes if we manipulate more on the other side, it can just retract inside. So this uh, is virtually a assistant free technique wherein you are not deforming the haptic in, in, pro, uh, in prolonged handling or any other problem. So the haptic remains absolutely pristine and virgin and it holds uh, in that tunnel securely. So that haptic slippage during the procedure and in immediate post-op is prevented by the vicryl loop and it virtually makes it assistant free. Vicryl basically is a preventive measure to prevent it from slipping back. Yes, yes, sir. Protective guard. Yes, also. yes. It's a second layer of guard. You know, it will not uh, slip back. One more thing. So, there is a paper uh, in a technique which was published by Hitesh Agarwal and others where they've actually done kind of something similar to you where they've increased the length of the scleral uh, tunnel so that the haptic can, after Yamanis, be embedded into that. But this idea of using Vicryl is actually very short. So, that will prevent the slippage, which is something yes. which very commonly happens. Yes, sir. And actually we used another technique without the vicryl also that is also published in IGO wherein uh, we made these flaps but that time the vicryl was not there and we used fibrin glue in those patients. Why did you choose vicryl and not a non-absorbable suture? Because it is just, uh, it requires support only for some time sir and after uh, some time it absorbs and also the kind of, uh, we thought that some kind of sterile inflammation, it will lead to the scarring of the tunnel and virtually closure of the tunnel. Once vicryl gets absorbed, does the uh, haptic stay there? Or yeah, it, 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 it definitely stays there, sir, because we have a, we have a tunnel which is self-sealing. It's like a SICS tunnel. And when the IOP builds, both those, that tunnel gets opposed. That is only open from one side and it is closed from three sides. So it snugly actually uh, closes after the procedure. Before the next discussion, can I request all the presenters to be here? We have a photo at the end of this. This is the last presentation. So after the discussion, we'll have a photograph. Any more questions, comments? Thank you. Thank you, judges and the presenters. Uh, nice session on the innovations. And I thank you, thank all the audience for being here. Can I request all the judges and the presenters to come onto the stage so that we can have a photograph?